Oh, uh, Junpei. As he looks up, we see Junpei sitting in a room, and a group of students gather, and then enter. So, Oh, he thinks he could just say hi now. <laughs> Get out. As he stands, Junpei stares him down, him being the leader of this group of bullies, and just realizes he's not so big anymore. And the bully realizes that the scar on his forehead is gone because he actually pulled back his hair. Take a good look, says Junpei. I'm not going anywhere. Leave me alone. As he turns to take a seat, he feels an attack and dodges as Nito falls against the desk. Oh, you slippery little- Get him! One of them closes the door behind and a racket is heard as some students gather to the door and eventually it stops. And it's suddenly open and out is thrown Nito, the main leader of these bullies, and the rest of his entire gang, much to everyone's shock. Junpei then walks out, dusting off his hands. Everyone looks at him as if he's some ghost. As of today, the Phil Club is reinstated. Oh, no one wants to join? Cool. Don't cause a ruckus and leave me alone. As he heads back inside, murmurs would spread as they can't believe it's the same person. If anything, it's amazing, but his bullies are always feared by their teachers. Junpei knows this, so he was prepared. While picking up his stuff from, obviously, the fight, a red glint goes off from a camera he installed in the corner. Starting from now, I'm fighting back. Well, not too much. I almost caved in his chest. Yuji was right. It's not worth it. They only hurt you when they know they're stronger. They're pathetic. The day passes and rumors would spread. And while in class or at lunch, he sits by himself. And yet, he can feel everyone staring at him. And then suddenly, his phone rings. I don't have anyone in my contest. Well, except for unknown. As he picks it up, he asks who this is. It's me, Junpei. Itadori? Hi, what's going on? I mean, why are you calling me? If you still don't like your school life, I have another suggestion, but it's only because it's compatible. It's not a better option. You want me to join Jujutsu Tech? I want you to think about it. You will see things that will haunt you. If you're not strong enough, you will die. I'll do my best to help. All of us will, but it depends on how hard you work. <laughs> it's still better than being here. Alright, meet me outside. You're outside? Yeah, just in case I was waiting by, says Yuji. Running out of the cafeteria, he catches the attention of a few as he runs and runs until he reaches a hall. And looking to the stool gate, um, school gates my bad, from the windows, he sees Yuji waiting by on a motorcycle. That's what he looks like. Cool. He makes his way out and runs over and finally meets him. Hi, you're actually here. Throwing him a helmet, Yuji says not to overreact. But before you get on this bike, you need to pass a test. Why do you want to become a sorcerer, Junpei? Truly, because without proper motivation, you will die too early. I... I just don't... I want to believe that not all people are trash. That there's some reason to be alive. His words remind him of Yuta in a way, and he smiles. Tell that to the principal. What? I thought this was the test. It is. I was testing you for the test. Get on. Revving up his motorcycle, he waits for Junpei to get on and put on his helmet. And just as he does, Junpei looks back at his school and sees one of his bullies and just smiles as he just drives off. He says goodbye to his high school life and enters the world of Jujutsu. Of course, his mother will be notified and they'll say that he got scouted for a different school. But for now, it's up to Junpei if he wants to tell her the truth or a lie. And he actually decides to tell her as she's the reason that he honestly even wants to try. So, she's also kind of part of the Jutsu world now. But she has higher protection and also gets more money. So, yay! Again, Yuji is rich as hell. A month would pass. Where's Kuki Saki senpai asked Junpei. Did she tell you to call her that? Asked Fushiguro. Anyway, actually, I don't know. Just then, she arrives dragging a suitcase along. What's that for? Asked Maki. Um, aren't we going to Kyoto? Ah, the exchange is here, says Panda, not at Kyoto. No wonder our conversations have been so confusing. Ah, I bought all this for no reason. I'll be back. As she runs off, Maki tells Junpei to look ahead. Say hello to her sister school. Momo, Kamo, Kokichimuta in the flesh, Toto, Mai, and Miwa have arrived. Their aura seems dangerous, thinks Junpei. Even the blue-haired girl. She looks really nice, but I feel like she could kill me with one move. 
Well, I really am a sorcerer now. I'm casually talking about death. Big sis, with these words, Mai jumps into the arms of Maki who says, You're making a habit of this. Yeah, and you can handle it. Stop being so childish, Mai, said Momo. I never said I minded, said Maki. Oh, here they come. Making their way down the stairs, the teachers arrive with Yuji. Is Itadori a teacher too, asked Junpei. I mean, he is our age, right? Nah, he's just feeling important today. I heard that Fushiguro. I know. You okay? All nighter. <clears throat> Afternoon, everyone. Toto. Brother? He's your brother? asked Junpei. No. No, he's not, said Inumaki. It's complicated, says Yuji. Oh, sorry about this. It's okay, says Yaga. And you can all fill in Kugisaki when she gets here. But the rules go as follows. This year you'll be using the dungeon of Elysia. But you won't be facing curses this time. Well, albeit there'll be a few. But most of them are a great one. Uh, yes? Oh, sorry to interrupt, but where are all the other students? Asked Junpei. Right. Never cleared that up, did we? Said Gojo. Satoru! As they all shout that he says, okay, okay, doing it now. Those other students are students, but they're more like exchange students. They don't actually learn here. They're here for the benefits of leveling up. Most of them are here to just pass the time. They're upcoming sorcerers, says Utahime. Once they hit their limit, they leave. Limit? My system imposes a level limit on everyone. At that point, your only option is training your stats. You've graduated about a thousand of them from here. You can get stronger, obviously, but it will be without the system. Again, complicated. Okay, uh, got it. Yagane continues, and we cut to all of Tokyo strategizing. Kugisaki had returned. It's a tournament, she asked. Now we just have to figure out who we want to fight with. Leave Toto to me, said Maki. I'll take Okichi, said Panda. And I'll keep the curses at bay. Make it a little easier for you guys, says Inumaki. Can I fight Kamo? asked Fushiguro. Go ahead, but don't underestimate him. Kugisaki, you and Junpei can have Miwa. Also, this is really important. She looks nice, says Maki, but she will destroy you. Good luck. Alright. Good to know. What about your sister? asked Kugisaki. If I come across her, I'll handle it, says Inumaki, but she doesn't do close range fights, so she'll probably be targeting curses like me. Surprising enough, Kyoto had the same idea because they have done this a while back so they all started leveling up at the same time so they know who they should face and who honestly is their favorite um person to spar and fight against it's just a thing of theirs Miwa was gonna go for panda actually but that's just Miwa. honestly she's good for everyone here she's a good match against anybody so they just let her choose who she wants regardless of if it was their own option as well if she wants to jump in again Miwa is like very valued now she has like a lot of power they all then gather at the opening of the dungeon and face that massive black door and they enter and next they find themselves falling. What the hell, Itadori? asked Junpei. Oh, it's a new setting, says Maki. Nice. Skywalk. Kicking off the air, she springs on her head saying, I see them. Fushiguro? On it. Nue. Below him, his massive feather Shikigami forms and flies up catching everyone as they hang on tight and begin to glide down. As for Kyoto, they glide down on one of Muta's puppets. Puppets, why did I say it that way? Anyway, the voice of Yuji then echoes saying, There are no safe zones anymore, so be careful. Kugisake, Junpei, I put some return orbs into your inventories. Ha, <laughs> not gonna need it at all, she says. From the school, we see teachers sitting down and watching them fall on a TV screen. Massive monitor. Why the hell do you look so tired, asks Gojo. Tinkering, making a cursed doll. Kakugaji's demeanor shifts a bit as he says, Is that so? Yes, is that a problem? Of course not. So who do you think will come out on top? 30 minutes on the clock? Pick your students. Yes, for this exchange they have 30 minutes to fight, and however many students survive from which school determines who wins when the timer is up. Having already landed, everyone runs in a pack as they approach each other and feel the curses approaching as well. Ah, uh, bring it on! Toto bursts on ahead and is met by a kick from Maki as he barely dodges and he lands. He then turns and she appears beside him and kicks him away before chasing after. Kugisaki fires a nail towards the Kyoto team in its entirety and detonated it when she then feels her cursed energy just fade. She is then rushed by Miwa who knocks her in the stomach with her blade handle. She then rolls avoiding a tendril when she stops and she watches Junpei held up by Kugisaki while the others break into battle and get their opponents. 
As per their plan, Panda throws uh, Inumaki to the sky when he's then clobbered in the face by a puppet himself, and up ahead, Kokichi is running up. Long time no see, cursed corpse. His puppet is then crushed by a slap from Panda, who takes gorilla form and slams down his palm. Yes, it has. Up above, Inumaki then shouts, Flatten. But these words take form of kanji and expand in the air as he then screams and pushes it down, hitting the forest and crushing some curses and rumbling everyone. The ground beneath Muta cracks and Panda intensifies this as he would uh, stumble and block his face instinctively from Panda who was approaching, but Panda aims for his stomach. A puppet then rises from the ground to block but is smashed to bits as Kokichi is pushed back. Everyone spreads and their battles will begin. And as hard, it is, as hard as it is to believe, some of them aren't even categorized as Supreme Grade 1, but they can definitely match them already. For example, Miwa shows why she is so feared now as with one slash she extends her shadow style and cuts through Moondregs as it splits in half. And a scared Junpei is kicked in the stomach before Miwa then ducks a nail and then another before stomping Shadow Moon. All the nails then fall before her before even activating as they near her radius. She's using simple domain, she doesn't have a technique, but it doesn't matter, she's strong as hell. You guys are really good. You're gonna overtake me in no time. I'm ringing for you. God, she's so nice that it makes this annoying, says Kugisaki. But I am gonna have to end this quick. Sorry. As she gets in a fighting stance, Miwa disappears and they look for her. They're obviously scared. When their bodies are suddenly cut and she appears behind them. Whew. They have really scary juniors. Kugisaki and Junpei taken out by Miwa. This robotic voice echoes throughout the dungeon, at least Miwa a bit embarrassed. Yeah, I expected as much, says Momo from above. By the way, Momo is stronger, but she just doesn't like to fight as crazy. It's still not something that she's into. Everyone acknowledges that she has some pretty strong skills, but they also know that she will keep surveying because one of her highest skills is related to that. It's called Overview. She can mark the specific energy of someone and always keep an eye on them, but she has to be in the sky to use it. Basically, it's a very uh, beginner version of Yuji's observation skill, which is just insane. He has a praise on steroids. We then find Fushiguro running and heading for the mountain in this area as he looks to his side and sees Kama running and following beside him, charging bull. His shadow slings forward and releases his charging bull, at which point Kamo stops and turns his cursed energy to blood and he fires it forward as it strikes against the bull, but it just keeps charging forward. He's surprised and then avoids a kick as he then throws one himself. Fushiguro dodges and strikes him in the air using Orochi, which opens up its mouth wide, tossing up its snack, slicing exorcism. From below, Fushiguro watches as saws of blood would slide down the skin of his serpent and he unsummons it when he then barely blocks a piercing blood attack with his bare hands. This pushes him back before dispersing and spreads, turning to spheres around him that then fire. Cluster, said Kamo. As the blood pierces into Fushiguro, however, he drops into his shadow just in time, and the attacks meet and bounce off each other, slicing trees in half. Kamo lands and looks around carefully. The proud clan technique of the Zenin against the Kamo clan. I'm impressed with your mastery. From behind him just then, a massive elephant rises and fires at point blank an explosion of water condensed into one stream. Kamo is caught into it and swept away while his skin and flesh are slowly torn at. He cannot use his blood effectively because of the water. A small wave then rises and crashes, leaving Kamo in the midst of it, and he manages to rise and regain consciousness when he's then struck across the face, but Fushiguro is then uppercutted in the same instance by something that feels worse than iron. Then he's kicked in the stomach and sent flying. Oh, he used his blood to harden his skin. He's good, but it's not over yet. While he's still in mid-air and in no position to dodge, another piercing blood attack fires, but he spins and barely avoids a fatal blow to his kidneys before crashing to the floor. Endless Will's Abyss. His shadow ripples out and spews out from it an army of cones that snarl at and approach Kamo endlessly. He dodges a claw and chops down, splitting one in half before punching forward a massive blood sphere the size of a basketball. Crap. Cluster. Compressing, the sphere then explodes, piercing through the heads of each divine wolf present. <sighs> Doping. A mark would blister across his eye, and he disappears, appearing right before Fushiguro and striking him in the chest, but the boy just smiles as he discharges an incredible amount of electricity, leaving Kamo screaming. I'm not done yet, shouts Fushiguro.
God, you're a pain. Would you stop doing that? asked Maki. She sways back, avoiding a punch from Toto, and strikes at him in the stomach, but he blocks and is pushed back, allowing Maki to get behind and swing down with a kick. However, Toto disappears again, and she instantly turns with a punch aimed at him because she guessed that he would be right there. It's disorienting when you do that. That's the point. Saying this, he disappears, leaving behind a bubble of cursed energy, which is blown away by Maki's punch. So, Toto is obviously very, very smart, so he knew how to optimize the time he had with leveling up the most, and now he can use a skill that lets him release spores of his own cursed energy everywhere. His skill is called Bubble, and his skill, uh, Cursed Energy Control, this combined allows him to damn near teleport, like I said before. He can literally leave behind like these bubbles of cursed energy wherever he wants and spreads them. It's kind of like having a... Um, like spreading a virus, except in this case it's not contagious, it's just that anywhere those bubbles are, he can get there. This combined with cursed energy control obviously means that he can maintain them for about, let's say, five minutes. And yes, he doesn't need to clap anymore, if y'all forgot, I mentioned it before. Maki suddenly disappears and is struck across the face as she's slammed into a tree, but upon making impact, she appears in the air and is axe kicked in the stomach. Now, because he can also teleport and also still use his technique without clapping his hands, it means that Toto can teleport himself and others without needing to clap. It only makes this more disorienting for people. While falling to the floor, she kicks the air and lands, cratering seven feet deep. Alright then, I have warmed up enough. So have I, said a falling Toto. As he lands, they both rush at one another, but Toto is struck in the face. Feels like being hit by a sledgehammer, but my shield skill can hold it off. Let's dance! My bet's on Miwa, says Mei Mei. Techniques are great and all, but she's grown well. It's almost as if she's using domain amplification. She practiced it every day on hunting days, especially her quick draw. Ah, uh, she tried to max out her agility, didn't she? Asked Gojo. But I'm putting my money on Fushiguro. Oh, Toto got beaten, says Yuji. She didn't have to hit that hard. I'll be back. As he stands and leaves, he starts walking out, and Gojo finally feels it a veil being poured over them, and very soon everyone senses this as well. They rush outside, with Yuji running ahead, and upon reaching the end, he uses observation. Veil set to cage all faculty members and Itadori Yuji. As the teachers arrive, Yuji says that it's meant to keep them all in, so that they can reach the dungeons and help the students. Alright then, let me break it, says Gojo. Holding his hands together, however, Yuji makes a sign of the boar. It's fine, I got it. Slowly a crack begins to show until the barrier shatters in instants, much to Gojo's surprise and everyone's. Ugh, someone's entering the star tomb. I'll get them. There are enemy sorcerers approaching. And curses, says Yuji. Saying this, he flies on ahead and enters Tengen's building and easily guesses which door is the real one because of his observation, and he enters a forest kept dark by an enclosed space. He then runs and runs until he sees a curse approaching the hangar close by the gate that allows to the entrance of the star tomb, the very place that the last plasma vessel died. With quickness, Mahito turns and sees Yuji walking over. Ah, how'd you know? Get away from me and I'll exercise you. Don't you mean or you'll exercise me? In an instant, he is grabbed by the throat and slammed to the floor, tearing through it and spreading fissures throughout the forest. Did I fucking stutter? Mahito with a scream then explodes with spice, but upon nearing him, the attacks are forcefully stopped as Yuji activates domain amplification and grows its range while using his telekinesis and literally tries to flatten the curse's body. God damn it! He's only using cursed energy to- No, no, I don't want to die! As if all his bravado and confidence from before had been a lie, the curse of humanity begs for his life as his insides are churned until he is splattered to a bloody pace. You better hope we don't meet in your next life. Standing up, he then walks to the hangar and weaves signs as his body explodes with cursed energy, taking the form of a dome that then pulls back and encases it into that encases around the hangar, and then it just dis disappears like suddenly. And in the place of the hangar, there would be something new. So when he opened it, he saw a door leading to a dungeon, and he opened that door. He was literally in the sky. The door was in the sky. If they want them so bad, they can fight for them. The real hangar is in there somewhere. He's created a new dungeon containing disaster class curses. This is from his barrier skill. Basically, that um, it allows him to interact his dungeons with reality and 
basically do almost anything with them. I'll go into more detail about that later when the calling game starts. He then closes the door and starts to leave when the doors to the star tomb open. He turns and steps forward. He sees none other than Tengen. Welcome. This isn't the first time I've been here. Your technique keeps acting up. Ah yes, this is the final stage. We'll find a plasma vessel then, whatever you need to do. I mean, you're just making this worse at this point. Yes, at the cost of another life. As he walks off, Yuji says, yeah, because I was talking about a sacrifice when I said that. I'll make you a vessel, you responsible sorcerer. Tengen is surprised by these words and asks if he means this. Don't make me rethink my decision, damn it. Go back in. Ah, uh, he's such a softy. As Yuji exits the building, he turns and sees Haruta running by, and with a giddy smile on his face, he tries to, like, you know, get at Yuji, but he is splattered to bits by a telekinetic pulse in an instant. Haruta's technique gathers luck in the simple sense, but it meant nothing to Yuji, whose stats guaranteed he would always get his way. Like, I didn't mention to y'all his stats. That man is not losing to nobody. I dirtied the area. Whatever. But whoever did this, they have been planning this for a while. But they're so boring. By this point, the rogue band of sorcerers that Kenjaku had gathered for this had already been beaten, so only a few curses remain. Skill. Solo Solo Level 40 Striking into the stomach of a giant wasp curse, Utahime blows his guts out. She no longer gives a boost of 200 to her allies, but can also do the same to herself without the need of a dance. She can completely omit this, and if anything, it's even more powerful now. This gives her beyond hysterical strength matching the likes of Maki, but only while she's using the technique. Her base strength stat is only in the 50s, but she could catch up if she trained more. As the curse falls and begins to fade, she finds more heading for her, and all at the same time, the curse is coming from a giant cursed womb in the form of a hive. So obviously, the ones that she's facing look like bees or wasps or a combination of them. <sighs> Alright, let's do this. Lunging forward, she leaps and blows off the head of one and dodges a stinger, and she grabs a hold off of it and swings even farther into the sky. She then flows with so much cursed energy that she actually instinctively uses reverse curse technique to heal the poison now. She uses the curses as a stepping stone until she appears above the womb and punches it with all her might and cracks it in two. It splits to 100 pieces and now falls a growing larva that then turns to ash. However, these wasps are still spreading. Luckily, Gojo is here and they're all blown away in an instant when he arrives. And as she falls, Utahime sees the smiling Gojo. Not bad. Oh, shut up. As she lands, her cursed energy subsides as Gojo appears right beside her. Let's do this then. Don't slow me down. Get off my back and just run, goddammit. Get rid of these things. She blitzes forward and kills one of them in a punch while Gojo opens his arms wide and many of them begin to be pulled to him aggressively before being turned to nothing by a blast of red. God, he gets high off of this stuff, I swear, she thinks. Now for the results of the exchange. Toto has been taken out by Maki. Mai taken out by Unumaki, Fushiguro taken out by Kamo, Kamo taken out by Maki, Momo taken out by Panda, Kokichi taken out by Panda. Maki, Miwa, Inumaki, and Panda remain, so Team Tokyo wins. Having finished, the group walks out of the dungeon and are talking amongst themselves, and they regret how much they uh, didn't get to do and certain things that they should have done. But all that stops when they see wasps flying around and their sensei is going ham. What the hell happened? said Junpei. Ah, oh, we got attacked, says Kuisaki. Don't say that so casually, thinks Junpei. Two days then pass. We are at a beach. And you still think this plan of yours will work, asked Jogo. Maito is dead. Our plans will still work, as they're supposed to, but now I'm gonna have to put a little bit of elbow grease in. Why are you so certain Itadori Yuji will be of no consequence, asked Hanami. I no longer think that. As a matter of fact, it's fair to say that he has already reached the level of Gojo Satsuru. But that's what makes it all the more fun. October 31st, a veil falls over the entirety of Shibuya with a radius of 400 meters. Non-sorcerers are unable to escape because of the veil inside the one covering Shibuya, and they all keep calling for one person. Satsuru Gojo. Bring Satsuru Gojo. They all keep saying that, says Ichiji. He speaks to Maki, Miwa, Kuisaki, and Junpei. So, that last attack wasn't just a one-off thing? 
says Junpei. And you really want us on standby? Maki asks. Mr. Gojo will head in and handle it all, so there's no need to interfere right now, says Nita. She speaks to Fushiguro, Kamakokichi, and Mai. I mean, you're not wrong, but it feels too deliberate, says Kokichi. They must be confident they can actually hurt him to do this kind of stunt. Well, that's what he's here for, said Maya. She points to the sky and up above, sitting on Charmander, who had uh, tripled in width and length. His scale sharp and reddened, and his horns grew as well, was looking majestic as hell. Let's see what these bastards come up with, he thinks. The last team would be Kusa, um, Kusakabe, Panda, Toto, and Nita's little brother. He also got a little bit of a level up. Uh, think of his abilities like a berserker now. He literally has a skill called berserker where he kind of just goes ham. No injuries are applied. No matter how much you hurt him, they don't get any worse and he gets stronger. I just wanted to put that in because I thought that was a cool ability to get to that kind of insignificant character. But anyway, inside, Gojo arrives and floats onto the train tracks of Shibuya Station where he sees Jogo, Hanami, and Dagon. Dagon evolved very fast uh, to kind of make this balanced for this whole plan. And the hole he came through then began to close up as Sachu looked around seeing all the civilians kept at bay who were so scared because they had no idea what was going on. Don't worry, I'm not running away. How long's it been, Fuji? Don't cry when you lose this time. Huh. <laughs> I think it's you who should have an excuse ready this time, Gojo Satoru. Now up above, past the station, Yuji heads for Mei Jingu Mei Station and jumps off his summit as it disappears and he enters. Waiting for him inside is an agent. Itadori. Hey, tell me everything. Uh, of course. She then explains that there are curses roaming through the lower levels of the station. Where do they keep getting these curses from? The only one who can get this many. Geto Suguru, right? But you defeated him. Yes, and I left his body completely intact. His brain fresh and frozen. And his heart, I shattered his heart. His body, it's his body. As he runs up, he tells the agent to go. Tell everyone you can. Gojo Sensei is in trouble. Do it now. Y yes. He then makes a left and jumps down a staircase and past one of the turnstiles. He then lands before turning right and seeing a grasshopper. It turns his head. What do you want? Before he can speak even another word, it is flash frozen as the beast Fenrir walks past, growling to the skies. His power is felt through and shakes the entire station. And I mean everything. Meanwhile, back for um, Gojo's fight, Hanami is sent crashing into the wall near the tracks and catches herself, standing parallel to it. Dagon at that moment then begins to flood everything, making Satsuru jump to the ceiling and watch as the civilians are crushed by water pressure and drowned. I'm sorry, I really am. I can't save everybody, but you. Dagon? Dagon, stop using your technique, shouts Jogo. Leaping down, Gojo strides along the waves and grabs the curse by the face as he releases his curse technique and begins to crush his head while the water below disappears as if it was never there to begin with. Slowly, he levitates down as he continues to crush the curse and shows a manic smile. You're gonna have to pay for that. Hanami and Jogo then move in with domain amplification, but are kept at bay by infinity while Gojo then continues to crush and crush until they're left splattered with blood. It's heart-wrenching, the youngest of them just dead before he could reach his full potential. They retreat and begin to kill more humans while keeping distance, and they know that they just need to hold on for a little bit longer. Soon, it came. A train full of curses. Yuji having figured out what this might uh, mean, what is happening, raided Mei Jingume and flew out towards Shibuya. Kenjaku knew Yuji was clearly fast as hell, but it wouldn't matter. By the time he would have reached Shibuya's veil, taking the time to destroy the inner veil, tell everyone what's going on, it'll be too late, says Kenjaku. Your student will come, but I'm expecting that. The moment he comes... You do know that you're dead, right? Maybe it's because I'm not great at sharing, but he's already surpassed me. As he cracks a smirk, it leaves Hanami and Jogo uneasy, but Kenjaku says, That's what I'm counting on. I'm gonna need him in his dungeons. Goodbye, Gojo Satoru. See you in what, like, 100 years? Gate close. A puppet of Mekamaru watches this, and he stops in shock. There's no way. What What happened? asked Fushiguro. One of my puppets fit. They just picked up footage. You'll want to see this yourself. He raises from the floor a puppet which opens his mouth wide, showing a virtual screen. 
and what they see is hair raising. There's no way, said my Itadori hit the nail on the head. We need to tell him that it's already, he's too far long to be reached now, said Kamo. I mean, if he goes there, it'll all be good, but it's fine. He'll, he'll figure it out. He's clever. For now, we should just move. Nyoi, and we gotta tell everybody. Kokichi sends out puppets containing the same information, and everyone moves quickly. And he hopes that somehow um, one of the puppets will reach Yuji, because he still just wants to let him know everything that's happening. Uh, well, seems like time doesn't pass in here, does it? Gojo lays in what may be described as hell. A pile of bones are below him, and skeletons aim to touch him, but cannot. Whatever that wacko wants, he's not gonna have it easy. I feel more scared for him. Putting away the earpiece transported to him, meaning that Kukichi's message did reach him eventually, Yuji put it in his inventory and tells Fenrir to hurry, as the beast would growl and does so. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, but I'm feeling anxious. Luckily, they reach Shibuya Station in a few seconds, and they find Inumaki gathering people away from the fading carcasses of curses, when he then turns and watches Fenrir and Yuji land. What's wrong? He asked. Gojo sense has been sealed. Alright, leave this to me. You go. Take care of him. Fenrir nods as they run off, and a woman then asks, Who, who was that? What's going on? Who are you people? Yuji Itadori, you're seeing cursed spirits and we're Jujutsu Shi. Not that it matters at this point, says Inumaki. Running inside quickly, Yuji and Fenrir keep up uh, the fence. Obviously, they don't know what's going on here. And as they head down, they feel two signatures heading for them. But down further is someone who he cannot identify yet. But he is certain that Gojo is down there as well. And he must have halted their plans because it's Gojo. We then find Yuji taking a turn around a little shop with Fenrir. And they run down. Once was left, he sees someone. He stops. There you are. Give me Gojo Sen. You don't have him. Hanami and Jogo get on guard as Fenrir snarls and they start to notice snow falling. It shouldn't even be possible by any means. Now they're worried and from Yuji's body begins to radiate domain amplification. And in the blink, both are clobbered and thrown to the floor as volcanoes would sprout in the corners and crossfire towards Yuji, allowing the two to roll away. But the fire just disappears before it even reaches him as Hanami is pounced on and fire's roots, which are clawed through and flash frozen by the beasts before being shattered to frost in instance. Just from this one claw attack by Hanami, a massive trill of ice envelops the entire half of the room and she shivers as the beast approached. Yuji then chases down Jogo and pounds him relentlessly with blow after blow, which Jogo tries to weaken with his own dome amplification, but to no avail. He is struck to the floor again and he then is pulled up to be smacked down by a paw from Fenrir, who had just taken care of Hanami. This slams him through floor after floor with such power that he crashes to the very bottom, all while leaving a trail of ice behind until he stops and finds it hard to even breathe at this point. In the cold, dark regions of the train tracks all the way underneath, one stream of light illuminates him and is quickly ruined by Yuji and Fenrir descending. Your wood friend's already snowflakes in the air. You're probably breathing her. As he touches down, Jogo gets up coughing up blood and still struggling to breathe or even regenerate at this point. Activation of curse technique while using domain amplification? How? You tell me. I'm just playing the game. He falls back to his knees as his body freezes over and bit by bit his body loses heat. His volcano head stops while well, bubbling, turns cold. He keeps coughing up blood. You humans. You fakes. None of that's gonna really matter, Curse. What's gonna matter is who won. He died quicker than I thought he would. Ugh. Who's the dumbass who had this idea, eh? Right, they're dead, says Toji. A dead man walking. Toji Fushiguro turns and walks to the edge of the building where he was just summoned. With Awasaka, Ogami, and her grandson dead, he was not just a creature meant to kill and find the strongest. Below, a war between special great curses and sorcerers occurs as Kenjaku released a few in order to buy himself some time from these monster kids. And amongst them, Toji saw, in his opinion, the strongest one and fell willingly parallel to the skyscraper. His eyes focused on one, Maki Zenin, who turned to see him falling. As he has no cursed energy just like her, she with her senses noticed him before anyone else on her team did and a massive explosion occurs. 
Kugisaki and Junpei turn from the floor and watch as dust is blown to show the two holding back each other by the hands. Their feet tear through concrete as they struggle back and forth until Toji is struck in the stomach by a kick. Though he gags, uses this as momentum and flips into the air and then throws Maki to the sky before chasing after her. He has no cursed energy, right? Asked Junpei. Kugisaki agrees. He's just like Maki-senpai. Appearing above her with a swing and with a drop kick, he is met by her arms blocking as he would then see her activate her steel body and he hears his own bones creak. Who the hell are you? Shots Maki. Toji remains unresponsive but a massive grin shows across his face. From down below, Maki shouts that the rest of her team run away and meet back with Miwa who went on ahead. I can deal with this guy. Realizing that this battle is not something they can interfere with, all they can do is run off and get out of her way, hoping that she'd win. The two monsters clash over and over as they fall and are knocked back, and now the true battle begins. But elsewhere, Miwa herself is caught in an unlikely battle, as she holds her blade while she stands on a trail of ice built between two buildings. She no longer holds the same peppy look and is ready to kill as the monk scowls at her. I need to get to Master Sukuna. Move! Sukuna? Ryoman Sukuna? But he's... He's dead, right? For now. In a flash, Miwa swings with Utahime holding her hand up to block while reinforcing her flesh and bones when her hand is backhanded and thrashed to pieces and is barely held together as Miwa moves forward with the thrust. This attack is sidestepped as Uraume then swings at the sorcerer who has half of her body frozen in ice but then blows us away with an array of cursed energy. New Moon the image of a crescent moon reverberates behind her in black and white as she swings down and from above, a massive slash cracks into the building behind Utahime and also eradicates her ice construct. Zooming in, we then see them free falling as Uarume is genuinely impressed. Alright, you forced my hand. Good, because I need to meet back up with my friends. I don't have time for you. Will these girls be able to measure up? What does Kenjaku plan on doing now? Find out in the next part of Jujutsu Kaisen. Hope y'all enjoyed this. Peace. I'm gone.